Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back again with Matt Kelly for another episode of the award-winning Compliance Into the Weeds. I am coming to you from Compliance Week 2024 in Washington, D.C. Matt, as always, in the worldwide studio of Radical Compliance. Welcome back, Matt. Hi, Tom. Good to be here. Matt, we had an interesting uh, FCPA enforcement action drop late last week, Trafigura, a yet another Swiss company coming to grief. Uh, because they did stupid things like talk about paying bribes in Brazil, but they did it in the United States. In addition to that utter stupidity, which gave them gave the DOJ U.S. jurisdiction, what about this matter interested you? Tom, a lot. And I think that probably the least interesting thing from a veteran compliance officer's point of view might be the actual scheme itself to bribe. This was uh, government officials in Brazil. This was Petrobras because Petrobras always seems to crop up in any enforcement action in Latin America. But what really struck me was that Trafigura, I, th I keep pronouncing it Trafigura. I don't know if I'm mispronouncing that, but Trafigura did a lot of bad things. This was a fairly substantial amount of money that the company was funneling down to Petrobras executives in shell companies. But they did not self-disclose. They did not embrace a spirit of cooperation when the investigation first began. They had some problems with trying to implement reforms or implement things such as employee discipline. So there was a lot of not flattering stuff here. Oh, and they were recidivist behavior offenders, not with anti-corruption, but they had a history of other corporate misconduct in other jurisdictions. So all of this li lines up to a big picture of not good. And yet at the end, Trafigura did not get a compliance monitor. So this is the, by my count, fourth FCPA enforcement action we have seen in recent months where there was some imperfection in how the company was handling its misconduct. Either they didn't self-disclose or they weren't cooperating right away or some combination of the two, or they were recidivist offenders, and yet no monitor for any of the four. And we can go through who they were, but I am left puzzled now that what is the Justice Department's standard for when they are going to impose a monitor? Or are we going to go this new route uh, of enhanced compliance reporting, where essentially companies like Trafigura, which will have to do this, they are going to submit annual progress reports on their compliance program and the reforms of it and the strengthening of it. And they do that throughout a three-year term, whether that is a plea agreement because you pleaded guilty, as Trafigura did, or a non-prosecution or deferred prosecution agreement, as others have done. But if we have these enhanced reporting obligations, is that going to be a sort of a new substitute for compliance monitors? I am left confused, and that is my big takeaway from this case. Befuddlement can lead to enlightenment. But first, a note on pronunciation. All Texans emphasize the first syllable of any word. Hence, insurance, hurricane, or my personal favorite, omnipotent. Hence, Trafigura. Nevertheless, I agree with some of your befuddlement, but I would add, or perhaps go in a little different direction on the bribery schemes, because there was great detail given to those and uh, two parts to that bribery scheme that I thought warranted discussion, Matt. Uh, number one was the pot of the creation of the pot of money to pay the bribe was baked in to the sales price uh, paid by Petrobras. And it was 20 cents for every barrel of oil purchased by Trafigura. And that I think is difficult for a compliance professional to ascertain simply looking at documents. You might need a little more forensic skills. But the second thing was the bribery scheme involved payment of false invoices by a second uh, business unit of Trafigura, and not the Brazilian business unit, but the, the one from Singapore. And I'm not sure unless you had someone looking at the entire package or the entire company that someone would pick up that bribes were being funded through fraudulent third parties in Singapore to pay bribes in Brazil. It was a sophisticated internal bribery scheme. And then the last point, which I'm not sure I had seen before, is there were two executives in on this at Trop Figura. One, the first one, who was named executive number one, 
he left Brazil and went to Singapore. And so executive number two, who took his place, then worked with him when he was at the Singapore business unit. And it gave me a more pause to think about, do you need to look at where various actors have moved to see if they are engaging in nefarious conduct? But those are uh, all monikers of into the weeds that um, perhaps we could go into. But some of your larger points, I think, really bear a, a deeper dive discussion particularly around either enhanced reporting or lack of monitorship. And if I could maybe throw a third one into those two, CCO certification. Are we going to have one CCO certify this? Is it that one CCO will have to, but will it be the same person who started? Where do we go, go down that road? I, I have a bunch of thoughts here. First, of course, I'm going to continue to pronounce it Trafagora because while they may pronounce it that way in Texas, up here in the Northeast, we are, of course, the cultural arbiters of all things in the country. It just feels a New Englandy way. But I think what Trafagora was doing with the contracts for payment and trying to mask the bribery there, that's a very good point. And it, I guess I would immediately be thinking about the Justice Department's FCPA resource guide does talk a lot about what are the payment terms for a third party and are they standard payment terms? And you could try to look at these contracts through that lens. Are they not just standard within your business, but are they standard within your whole industry? Or is your specific company doing some sort of contracting arrangement, which is so off the wall compared to peers, that maybe that sticks out? That would probably be one criteria that compliance officers would try to, should probably try to keep in their heads. All of that said, you're also right that this is going to be tricky to figure out. So yet again, it points to the importance of working with internal audit, who probably would have the forensic ability to sniff these sort of arrangements out. But also maybe I think in the future, and probably there are vendors out there who would say, no, the future is now. There probably is technology you could use to bake in good forensic capability into your controls, your enforcement of controls, but there is a blend here of what I would call soft controls dictating what's the contract terms and hard controls of a system actually blocking payment to a company that has some sort of non-standard or unusual contract. But these are not issues that are going to go away. Fraudsters are very clever people and they're, they don't do this sort of a scheme, they'll do something else. But Tom, to the other point that I comes up right away is your question about CCO certification. So yes, Trafagora's CCO will need to sign and certify their the effectiveness of their compliance program three years after the end of their plea agreement. So I guess that would be in mid-2028. But so far, for all of our talk about CCO certification, we should remember that no CCO has actually signed any of these things yet because they are that new and it takes three years. And I think, Tom, if I am doing my math correctly, the very first company that will have a CCO certification to get signed is Dansk Bank, which will have that signed at the end of this year. And no, their current CCO is not the one who negotiated the compliance program and the settlement with Donsk Bank for their huge money laundering scandal that came about, I think it settled at the end of 2022. That CCO moved on earlier this year and their head of internal audit was promoted to be CCO, which is fine. That is not an unreasonable sort of career track. But I had asked the Justice Department specifically, under a scenario like that, who is supposed to sign the DPA or the CCO certification or whatever we're going to do. But at the end of the three-year term, who is the actual person who is going to be signing it? And they said, whoever's the CCO at that time. That is the official policy of the Justice Department. We haven't come to that moment yet, although it is coming quickly. But I think that does raise some interesting food for thought. If you are the compliance officer who might submit these enhanced reporting requirements, and we can get into what those are, or you're the one who's going to certify the effectiveness of the program that you hadn't designed at the time of the resolution. How is that really going to make you feel? And how confident would you need to be to do that? 
how much control over the compliance department. And we've talked about this before. What if you, the second one on the scene, don't feel that great about the, the program anymore that somebody else had built? What if you don't want to sign it? And these are all still hypotheticals, but we are rapidly coming to the day where they will be real. You mentioned something in there, Matt. First of all, AB uh, will have to sign a uh, certification, but that will be a year after Donska Bank. And at this point, they have the same CCO who was there during the pendency of the enforcement action. And to, to date, she's still there. So perhaps we get some clarity there. The other point, though, is the enhanced reporting. It, is it every company agrees to report to the Department of Justice, whether they have a monitor or not? Do you see anything in the settlement documents which would give you uh, uh, pause one way or the other to say, yeah, this is a little bit more than just a quarterly or even an annual report? Let's just go through what Trafigora and some of the others have actually committed to do. They are going to, throughout the three-year term, they must make annual progress reports to the Justice Department. And for the very first one, I think they come up with, they're calling it an action plan. So the deal has been signed. You have a program that is effective enough to get it resolved. Then you must come up with an action plan for further improvements as necessary. What testing are you doing? What policies are you reviewing? Things like that. You have to submit that action plan to the Justice Department for their review. They give you feedback. I think it's within 60 days. Um, and that's for right away. And then for one year out, two years out, three years out, I guess three years is when you certify the final thing. But for years one and two years out, you come back with a progress report. Here's the plan that you approved Justice Department last year. These are all the things we've done. Now here's our plan for the next 12 months. How does this look? And you go through that whole process all over again. I would say I was looking it up. One of the other recent FCPA enforcement actions are called Freepoint, which is another commodities broker that was involved in, I think it was Petrobras, but Freepoint must go beyond that to have quarterly in-person meetings with the Justice Department in the fraud section to review what's going on with our plan. I don't think that Trafigura had that, but... We had Gunvor was another Swiss commodity broker. They got swept up in something with Petro Ecuador, and they were settled just, I think, last month. But Gunvor is making quarterly annual progress reports and enhanced reporting. Um, I will admit I am not exactly sure how far back we have been calling it that, but within the last several months now, we have these several cases where there is enhanced reporting, but more than that, it's like there's not a monitor. And with Gunvor and Trafigura, both of them within the last several months, the settlement documents do specifically say that a monitor is not necessary given the enhanced reporting requirements and the CCO certification that will be forthcoming. The Justice Department does see that as a valid alternative to a compliance monitor. I'm not necessarily opposed to that in theory, but in practice, what is the sort of infraction or the imperfections that you would still be able to get away with this? Like I said, Trafigura did not self-disclose, was not rushing to cooperate at the start. Freeport was another one where they did not self-disclose and they weren't rushing to cooperate at the start, although both companies later changed their tune. SA did not disclose and did not, they had recidivist behavior, recidivist FCPA behavior. Trafigura had, I think, an environmental and an export control issue in its past that it had settled. So that's not anti-corruption recidivism, but SAP had that and SAP didn't get a monitor. They all have this enhanced reporting. So what are the circumstances for real where we will get a compliance monitor? Because all of these cases, you could at least reasonably argue, yes, we should have a monitor, but they don't. And here we are. So under the monitorship guidelines, which were announced by Kenneth Polite in early uh, January 2023, uh, number one on the criteria was, did you self-disclose? But number two was, had you created an effective compliance program and had you tested it? And that was the part I didn't see laid out anywhere in the settlement documents, either the information or the plea agreement. 
there was some discussion about the company building out a compliance program, but I don't think I saw the words effective, and I certainly didn't see the words tested. Did you see anything which would lead you to believe the company had taken those steps, man? I didn't see anything that expressly said, yes, we have done extensive testing, but testing is clearly, I am sure that Trafigura and the others have tested at least some part or perhaps all of their program. They will be testing as part of their enhanced reporting. Um, but more than that, Tom, I come back to some of the other criteria for an independent compliance monitor, which is, has the company's risk profile changed to such a great extent that they're not likely to have a repeat offense? And I think you and I have talked about this in prior uh, podcasts. One excellent example that leaves me scratching my head is SAP. Now, I know SAP is trying mightily not to have FCPA troubles, but it's had them before. It had them again, and they settled, I think it was in January. But SAP sells software around the world to government contractors or to government agencies in high-risk jurisdictions. That hasn't changed. They did it before. They're doing it now. They'll do it again. And I get that they have implemented stronger compliance controls, but has their risk profile really changed to such an extent that they didn't deserve a monitor, although they did have a fairly substantial criminal penalty? And I will get on my high horse again and again about this. It seems to me that could we get away with a smaller criminal penalty and instead go with a compliance monitor? It's a lot of money either way, but only one of those really affects better corporate culture. And the other one, the penalty, just the investors are shelling that out. That's money they don't get to keep. We're probably going to have to revisit this issue again, Matt. Let me turn to a couple of things. One, pick up on, or one that I want to pick up on some of the facts you gave around the recidivist nature. It seems to me that category of analysis is moving towards the amount of the fine and penalty, which may lend itself towards your overall fine, uh, belief that the DOJ is now punishing people more with a dollar fine than uh, a monitorship or trying to, to reform the true corporate culture. But one other thing from the press release, it said the company's conduct began in 2003. So that's 21 years ago. Mm -hmm. But even more interesting to me was that the conduct laid out in the information and the plea agreement began in 2009. And that seemed to coincide when they moved discussions of the bribery scheme to the United States. There was nothing in the settlement documents which said monies were wired through the U.S. banking system. I didn't see anything that said emails went through a server, which was domiciled in the United States. So it would appear from the resolution documents, the only basis for jurisdiction was they were stupid enough to come to Miami or Houston or wherever they went to talk about the bribery schemes. And I think that's a very good lesson for every other Swiss trading company. Don't come to the United States to discuss bribes you're going to pay in Brazil, Singapore, or other. Any real thoughts on the time frame they laid out in the press? Not necessarily, uh, although I would say that you can't have a good Latin America corruption story without somebody arranging a meeting in Miami. Latin America, you got to meet in Miami somehow. But I do think going back to, is there going to be a monitor? Is there not going to be a monitor? What are we talking about here? It's, it is reasonable to note that a lot of the misconduct that did happen, happened many years ago. And the prosecutions have been going on for years. We began working on Petrobras enforcement, I want to say, like in 2013, I think, 10 years ago, 11 years ago. So I do wonder if perhaps, as much as we are wringing our hands about no monitor, how much of this is dictated by just that this is really old conduct and maybe the offenders at the time simply didn't understand that, yes, the FCPA is a real law, it was a real offense, and you have to take it seriously. All of these companies settling right now, everybody who did all of this, all of the leaders of those companies, they're all long gone. So would there be a difference between a company settling now with all sorts of unflattering circumstances, they still avoid a monitor, but that's because of Petrobras or some other Latin America misconduct from 2009, 2003, 2012, 
versus a company that is settling FCPA abuses that happened as recently as, say, 2019 or 2020. Because by then, everybody should have gotten the memo that the FCPA is serious. You do have to have a compliance program. You know, you, everybody should have known. It's voluntary self-disclosure. It is cooperation. And if you don't do these things, you are in hot water. I do wonder if we see a case more like that, would we get a compliance monitor? And I don't know because F SAP's enforcement is a lot like what I just described. And still, they didn't get a monitor. So I am, like I said, I am not sure what we are supposed to make of this. Under what circumstances would we see the DOJ impose a compliance monitor? Because now we have at least four cases in the last six months where you could reasonably expect that one might be there and one is not. So how are we going to explain this in a way that will help in compliance officers inform their leaders about what's expected? Matt, that seems like a great point to end this podcast on. I can't wait to see what comes up for next week. We will have to monitor this situation closely. There you go. That's my pun for the week. And I will just add, always pronounce the first syllable as your strongest. <laughs>